<laughs> what do you feel is the biggest challenge for small and beginning farmers? Uh, I think that one of the biggest challenge is that people are lacking methodology in how to do things. Mm -hmm. There's a which is, there's a lot of improvisation in how we're growing stuff, which is, which is okay because it's creative. But the more and more I do this, I just figure out that it, you know this this is a trade, mm -hmm. and you can't improvise being a baker. You can't improvise being a carpenter. You need to learn the basics. You need to learn the right tools for the right job. And I see that that's one area where there could be a lot of improvement because there's not a lot of support for that because there's not that much know-how, especially with farming human scale without tractors, right. you know, and just learning how to harvest, right? All of these things, it's, it's kind, of, kind of been forgotten. It's been forgotten because I guess it really hasn't been needed. Uh, most farmers were usually not business people. Yeah. They started farming, especially in America and Virginia, because of uh, need to eat. Yeah. You know, that's a pretty good reason to farm. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we always looked at business people as being more uh, finance generated and you go to school for business, but we never considered the farmers need to go to school for business and kind of how to manage their operations. Uh, do you have a solution in terms of how to deal with uh, this situation with farmers? Well, um, you know, apprenticeships on farms really help. Mm -hmm. And uh, on just good on good farms, and then just having tools that are out there to teach growers how to do stuff, I think that helps. And you know, I, we could talk about, you know, having better markets and have, having better marketing, but I just feel that, you know, if that was covered, mm -hmm. then the next step would be okay, how can we improve our farming efficiency at the farm? having the right tools, having irrigation, having drainage, having, you know, all of the assets that bigger farms have, mm -hmm. having agronomists that are following you, agronomists that know how to work the soil organically or not work the soil, right. no-till right. no and all of that. So, you know, just like a lot of support on the production side. And uh, anyway, that's where my, my thoughts are these, t these days. Gotcha. As you speak about the support that you get, I know you're in Canada, which is a different mm. municipality totally. Do you get a lot of support from extension agents and other small farm agents yeah. who know your system, not just you know, give you support because yeah. you're author, but understand no-till before you understood no-till? Yeah, well, no-till would be kind of the frontier. I don't, I, the agronomists are not there. Mm -hmm. But we do have a lot of support in, in Canada and Quebec especially for greenhouse production and all sorts of, and it, you see that where there was support, there's a, a lot of know-how. Mm -hmm. Because to have, you know, the farmer is busy farming, but the support cast that are experts in certain fields that are good at teaching and, and helping, that's rare. Mm -hmm. And um, so I see that. I see that, that in Quebec, because of the money that's been put in and that, there's a lot of good growers mm -hmm. because of that reason. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, how many market? I mean, how many customers do you have, say, on a regular basis, a yearly basis? We have on our farm about 200, 250 clients, mm -hmm. and that's been enough to support our farm. Okay. And how much revenue do you think you generate per year without those customers? The farm has been grossing 150 k. 150 thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Uh, that's on an acre and a half. Mm -hmm. So it's a small, small mall farm, and half of it comes back as our revenue, my wife and I. So 75000 for you and your wife? Yeah. On farm income? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot, but it's been, it's been good. We have uh, three months off. Uh, some of it is cash money, which we're not supposed to talk about. Uh, so there's been advantages, and then we've had a lot of our expenditures can be uh, put into our... Uh, business accounts and so there's there's been some you know it's been a pretty nice run good. Good, good, good. Now, how did you get to that 220 number was it immediate was it a slow growth process uh, I think it took us about four years to get to that uh, we always built on quality so people know us because of that we do have really good produce really fresh stuff and then just like over the years going to market having one client and another and another and having people coming back and we've been capped for 10 years now 
So there's growth, but slow growth, and, and it's off spilling to other growers. And so I kind of believe in that. Now, when you mentioned quality, how do you measure for quality? You use a brick scale, you use customer appreciation or customer value, or? Just curious. It's just quality is quality. Like when I look at stuff, if the grower is bringing, you know, turnips that have been eaten by flea beetles and, you know, there's a lot of exam radishes that are too big and it's just like all of these little things. Gotcha. So, yeah, and freshness. freshness. Harvested the day before, mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. It shows and it tastes different. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Were there any situations or experiences that um, made you want to almost give up or made you give up at any point while you're doing this? That <laughs> I remember when I was starting out and we were, I was, I was doing the farm, my wife was with the kids and we were building the house, building the greenhouses and putting all these hours alone by myself and, and we would do all this work at the end of the year when it got too cold to farm so I was building hoop houses and greenhouses when it was below frost and just alone by myself and just, um, these were days that were harder mm -hmm. but you kind of do it and then you go through it and then you just it makes you tougher and I don't know there's been a lot of situation where it hasn't been easy uh, to have a peer group really helped us so we would have a network of other farmers we would get together twice a year and just kind of share uh, hisses hits and miss mm -hmm. that really helped the support and the family also has been good I'd say that starting a business is not easy right but you know no pain no gain so what would you recommend to any beginning farmer not to do? Shit. So the list is long. Uh, don't watch too much YouTube. No Curtis Stone. Well, no, no, no. Curtis Stone is good, but you know, there's, there's. Right, that's no, no, but I mean, there's a lot of. It's it becomes it becomes confusing. Right. Uh, and I would say get training on a farm. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not the best farm, at least you'll kind of have a, a feel for what, what you're doing. But you should look for good farms and farmers that know what they're doing. Um, so that's number one. And uh, I don't know, just like, just stop thinking that you need to reinvent the whole thing also. You know, I see a lot of people, they want to start farming without plastic. They want to start farming without, with horses, which is, which is fine, but it's, it's going to be a big challenge. Uh, start farming and then they, 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 they're in, into permaculture and they make shapes and circles and then they dig their, their perma beds about two feet deep and it's just it's a lot of effort and it's just that's not how you grow vegetables. So like the double dig system and the, you don't... No, it's just yeah. you don't need that. Right, well, the Amish way of the horse strong. Well, the um, if you're an Amish that's fine it's because that's, that's what you way. want. Yeah, yeah, the Amish way is because they want to slow down. Right. Uh, I'm not sure you want to slow down because then you'll be kind of overworked. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how they deal with that, but they they probably put in long system, hours. Yeah. It's part of the system. Yeah. But as we speak as I speak about systems, you seem to be very systemic in terms of how you approach farming. Did that come from a schooling situation? You have an MBA in systems. You all in your mind. That's my mindset. Like for me, efficiency is the name of the game and systemizing thing is how you manage a lot of different things together. I just don't know, my mind works like that. I'm always looking to systemize things and to make it make them more efficient. And I think that farming, growing 40 different vegetables, you can't, like I said, you can't improvise that. So the best way is to have a system and a setup where everything relates to one to the other and then you're, then you have more fun. You can be more creative that way too. It's like learning the basics of playing guitar. You know all the, the chords and the, and the, and then once you have it nailed, you really know your stuff. Then you can go on and just kind of jazz and yeah. But you need but you need to have the foundation. The foundation for farming now you say is more system than it is system and information about how to grow those forty vegetables efficiently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, systems, information, right tools. Uh, there's a lot of wrong tools. You were asking me about what not to do. Getting a tractor is, is, is probably the biggest thing that I see. Right. Because then you get 
the tractor becomes the focus of everything on the farm. And I just, growing vegetables is not about having a tractor. You know, the tractor can be part of it, but it's not the main, and that's what people, a lot of people get confused. Now, I know Elliot Coleman was a big influencer for you. Mm. Were there any other influencers like uh, say, Dr. Lane Ingram and others who may have helped to, or more greatly influenced you that you may not mention? Uh, yeah, Elliot's been definitely my biggest influence, and still today, for who he is and what, how he talks and how he thinks. And uh, There's another guy that I really like that's been inspiring me and teach. I've been learning a lot from him and how he does things. Um, his name is Joel Salatin. Perhaps the people in Virginia have heard about him. <laughs> Not too far from here. Uh, I like uh, Joel a lot because, not because of his more spiritual or, but just because he just, he teaches what he knows and what he knows, he knows it well. And it's been well thought about and it works. And I like that, you know? And do you approach uh, agriculture from a spiritual perspective like others, especially nowadays? I, mean, I, I know I do, and I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of that question. Um, hmm. I think it's, for me, it was all about lifestyle and just being master of my own kind of reality, shaping the land according to how I see it, being create, creative and being part of the whole process and then meeting people and doing something good. I, I don't think I've never really kind of framed it in terms of spirituality, but it's been definitely nourishing my, my need to be uh, involved in something that is bigger than me. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of like sidetracking your question. And I'm not afraid of that question. It's just, it's, it, you know, spirituality for me now is growth. And, and, and being better than who I am today and accepting and, and, being, and being humbled and being uh, appreciative. So I find that in farming, that that's, these are really values that are there. You know, when you ask that question, many people's mind may jump to religions, which may make them uncomfortable. So the spirituality aspect, and if you, as you mentioned it, and I've delved very, very deep into this subject, but it puts you almost in a framework of the first recorded man, which is Adam. Yeah. In terms of, he was the first gardener. Yeah. Well, he was a market gardener. Yeah. <laughs> the first market gardener. He was yeah. <laughs> and he had a little bit better selling book than yours, but uh, that's yeah. how. <laughs> that's, that's success. Right. But I mean, we've kind of followed that mode of being back into the earth and that cycle of being, you know, stewards of the land, like a yeah. Joe Salatin. Yeah. Um, now I have a more of an agronomic question. Uh, I worked you in. You want to keep on. Talking about I, that? Well, for the state of, we have Virginia State University and sometimes they don't always, okay, on a sidebar we can definitely. <laughs> because, because I just want to say something, just like talking about Joel Salatin, mm -hmm. when he teaches, when he explains to us like pigs have snouts mm -hmm. and they're made to go on the ground. And then when we deprive their nature, we, we deprive ourselves of being with nature. And I, I just find this so simple, mm -hmm. and, but so profound. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how we got away from all of that. Like, uh, I'm, I'm really, in a lot of times, I feel very kind of, this is, we're, we live in strange, strange times. Many of us feel that way, and I think that's why some of us younger people, I'm sure we're around the same age, yeah. have kind of gravitated back toward that feeling of, working, and, you know, and capitalism greed has kind of really been the mantra. You know, yeah. I grew up in the Wu-Tang area where cash was everything around me, cream, get the money, dollar, dollar bill, y'all. But, <laughs> but that was, uh, yeah. <laughs> but that was our mantra to get money, Scarface and all this, yeah. can't yeah. trust anybody. And now you get back to the land and you get another relationship now with yeah. being humble by just one little seed. You know, that one little seed grows into this phenomenal that now can be managed and cultivated under our care. Anyway, I digress onto that a whole other kind of way, so I, yeah. <laughs> I asked a more agronomic question. Um, when I was in Ghana, um, and I spent five years there working on organic farms, we used row covers, or started to use insect netting mm -hmm. uh, because we had a major cabbage fly issue. Yeah. How do you control, let's say, um, pests coming in when you get ready to harvest, let's say, a cabbage? 
Well, we will take the nets out and then harvest, and that's it. And we, we sometimes use BTK for, for that problem in, in the cabbages. Uh, and then if we do that, then we're scouting mm -hmm. on a weekly basis, and we have uh, thresholds mm -hmm. that we, we're measuring against, and then if anything, we'll be spraying biopesticides, mm -hmm. uh, example for cabbages. But again, if it's not systemized, right. there's too many variables we, we kind of forget. So there needs to be somewhat of a, a, a calendar of, of events telling us, okay, that week you need to be scouting, and when you're scouting, this is what you're scouting for, and you need to have all of that pre-arranged, because otherwise you're just kind of like reacting to whatever's happening. So do you use like an input calendar? Do you, because yeah. I, yeah. and you d We have calendars for seeding, transplanting, all of the management aspects of every crop, mm -hmm. uh, and they're all based on sequence where I'm transplanting, 10 days later, I am cultivating. And then 15 days later for cabbage, I'm scouting. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it's all prefixed, mm -hmm. and then I change the game plan, if anything. But uh, at least I'm following a game plan. Gotcha. And, and do you use other uh, foyer sprays or insect insecticides? It was all fertigation and irrigation and under insect netting? Insect nettings, some biopesticide, and, and next year, and I shouldn't say that because it's too, it's too green to say, but next year we're going big on compost teas. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is compost teas, not compost leachates. This is like a Elaine Ingham KSS system where you're yeah. extracting. Yeah, so and uh, we have figured out a simple way to just irrigate all of that onto our crops. Mm -hmm. After transplanting them, mm -hmm. they're going to be irrigated with the sprinklers mm -hmm. and the compost tea goes into the sprinkler system and doesn't harm it because we, we check it with a microscope mm -hmm. and then we inoculate our plants with that, that was microbial yeah. and then we'll see what that does. How, does, how would that work in um, post harvest or this harvesting? Is a because then you have to count, uh, put in a post harvest interval after you spray the compost leach it and depending on what the compost is made of could yeah. put you into... Mo uh, there's no crops that are 30 days or less mm -hmm. And the um, compost tea will go in right after transplant. transplant. So that, that deals with that. Plus, I disagree with this perspective that compost will bring pathogens that are harmful. And so if I disagree, then I'm not going to follow that guideline. Because I'm at that point in my life where I don't feel I need to follow in the footsteps of things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to... Take the yeah. That's an excellent answer to that question. Yeah. Um, do you find yourself, uh, have you ever had any uh, in, well, fungal pressures, disease pressures that you that got too out of hand that beat your system? Well, we, okay, so we do a lot of tomatoes in a tomato house and that every year it's a challenge. Yeah. You have uh, wilt, you have fusarium, you have, have wilt, nematodes. Have, not, not nematodes I've never had, but we'll have um, Blanc, mildew, mm -hmm. downy mildew, we have white flies, but that's a very specific, you know, the tomato house is kind of like a, mo it's not a monoculture, but it almost is. In, okay, but that's how we, that, we, we manage that, so that's very specific. In the fields, one year I had downy mildew on my salad mix, uh, and that was pretty awful. And then that, then that was the start of us putting ramule wood chips and inoculating the fields with different microorganisms to try and counteract that. Uh, we've been good so far, and that's 15 years, but... Um, that's not bad. When you mentioned the, uh, when you, the wood chips, yeah. and I know you're in a new farm now, yeah. uh, and that's pretty much your system now, is that you're using more wood chips and you're not using the PTO as much, correct? Not using the tractor as much. The, um, no tractor. No tractor, I mean, well, no... the tractor to howl compost, and, right. yeah. but... I'm still, <laughs> after all these years, not convinced about tractor farms for small farms, like tractors for farms that are wholesaling and you have crews of 20, 30 people harvesting, yes. Mm -hmm. But on a small farm when there's four, five, six, seven, and we're 10 at the new farm, and still the tractor is not. Well, and I guess when I mean tractor in this case, I mean a PTO tractor, I mean yeah. a, your hand tractor, not necessarily yeah. a... Yeah, yeah, John did. Four wheel track right, right. where all the cultivating is done right. by but, pulling an implement. Mm -hmm. So, at your new farm, what are you doing there? 
it's kind of, I'll be showing some of those pictures, but we are experimenting with a lot of things. We've scaled up the market garden mm -hmm. uh, using the same principles that are in my book, but it's just we made more field blocks. Mm -hmm. There's more people uh, running the show. Mm -hmm. um, the management strategies are more open mm -hmm. so that we share responsibilities with the crew. Uh, we're working with ramule wood chips, we're working with compost tea, we've, we're working with a bunch of new tools. We're selling, in our second year, half a million of vegetables produced on site. 500,000. Yeah. How big is the site? Uh, the farm, the whole farm is 160 acres, but on that the market garden is 8 acres. There's 450 perma beds, and there's 10 of us running that show. And we work from 8 to 5.30 and uh, everything is designed to be really efficient. Mm -hmm. It was custom built, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's a big animal. <laughs> yeah, but, but again, we're showing that, we're showing many things, but we're showing that, again, the tractor is not... The, the washing station is mm -hmm. very important, mm -hmm. efficiency in there. Mm -hmm. uh, just the management practices, very important. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway. I'm upset about that. Indeed. About tractors. <laughs> Understood. I'm not a big fan of Jethro Tull either. It's a <laughs> I just I just I just feel that a lot of the focus is always on that. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you know, if we'd had better washing stations, if we'd had better scouting systems, if we'd have better softwares mm -hmm. for crop planning, and if we'd have people that are better at harvesting. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we do on the farm. Right. Half the you know, two days out of five we're harvesting from morning to evening. Hmm. And so that's a lot of harvest. Yeah, it's a lot of harvest. But then there's also a lot of washing and preparation and all that, which means you need to have a very good and efficient system that yeah. makes sure it's... Yeah, because there's a lot of produce. Right. Oh, you guys... Yeah, that's good. It's good. Great timing. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, two more questions. More stuff, yeah? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a few more. Um, what role do you see technology playing in the future of agriculture, especially small-scale agriculture? That's a tough one. Because you mentioned technology, yeah, you mentioned software. I, software, crop planning software, mm -hmm. integrating sales and yields and task management. All of that I really dig. Uh, robot cultivators and you know, ro system. hydroponic mm -hmm. system, uh, insects that are robots. That's the, that for me is very scary. scary. Mm -hmm. I, I wish we would just go back to nature and use technology to harness nature instead of trying to replace it with technology. Uh, and uh, I've been, I've been, some people have told me you should be optimistic, JM, because people follow you, and but uh, sometimes I'm a bit discouraged. Indeed. I see that engineers and are, t are again trying to take over the whole thing and just, we should be working with nature trying to understand it better mm -hmm. and using nature instead of trying to replacing it. Gotcha. Now, how do you, as, and I guess what I see in terms of the small farm arena is that technology is a bit different in terms of you have like Elliot Coleman utilizing these new hand tools that yeah. we've never conceived before yeah. with a power drill. Yep. Using the technology of a basic tool yep. to make a better tool. And I think maybe that's the direction that technology should play in, in agriculture. Yeah, appropriate, appropriate technology. Right, right. Appropriate technology for the small-scale grower. They need, they need to be inexpensive. They need to be versatile. They need to be simple. They need to be small. They need to be, you know, manufacturable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, you know, things are going fast in another way. So... So, last question. Uh, what's the future for GM after this conference here? Oh, I'm going to Germany tomorrow. And because uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to visit farms and my, my book is, is in German. Mm -hmm. So they've asked me to come and present it. So that's exciting. And then we're doing the planning for next year. Strategic planning. So it's crop planning, but also all of our objectives, our mission, you know, everything is going through and then we're planning hard for next year so that next year we're just we're just executing the plan so i'm doing that and i'm launching a master class in december mm -hmm. and i hope people will check it out because it's really cool putting a lot of work into that it's going to be two three years in the making and it's about showing people how to do things every step of the way hopefully helping mm -hmm. which is really what i'm 
I want to do. Very good. Yeah. But thank you so much, Dan. All right.